Welcome, my dear students and others, to this final lecture video from Chapter 12's coverage of the structures of solids. Now, in our previous video, linked to in the description below or possibly floating as an in-video card link over my head right now, I taught you about a few different other classes of solids. In this video, I'm going to teach you about this last kind of solids, polymers. So according to our text referenced in the description below, polymers, quote, contain long chains of atoms where the atoms within a given chain are connected by covalent bonds and adjacent chains are held to one another largely by weaker intermolecular forces. And by the way, I taught you about intermolecular forces in an earlier chapter referenced below. Polymers are normally stronger and of higher melting points than molecular solids and they are more flexible than metallic, ionic, or covalent network solids. With that said, Polymers are comprised, of course, of many, sometimes hundreds or even thousands of smaller molecules called monomers, all covalently bound together. So here are a few examples of natural polymers. For instance, the natural polymer DNA is made from lots and lots of monomers called nucleic acids. These would be the G's, C's, A's, and T's that you've learned about in biology class. Another example of a natural polymer are proteins, which are made of lots of amino acids, the monomers of the polymer protein. Follow. Another example is starch made of monomers of glucose and cellulose, a different structural polymer also made from glucose. So these are just some of many examples of natural polymers tethered together with their monomers in this table. So polyethylene, which is an artificial or human-made polymer whose structure is represented right here, is made from numerous repeating units of ethylene whose structure shown here, it's the monomer, all bonded together. So you get a bunch of ethylenes together, stir them in a pot, they polymerize, they form polyethylene. How does that happen? Well, this figure taken from our text shows how the polymerization process occurs. So each ethylene molecule breaks one of its pi bonds. And you should understand that every single time you see a bond, that is a straight line representation of a bond. It really represents two electrons being shared by those two atoms. So one of those electrons in an ethylene molecule like this, for example, will flow over here to the left and be used to form a bond with an ethylene monomer to its left. The other electron will flow to its right and paired together with the electron from the pi bond in this ethylene neighbor will then form a bond between these two carbon atoms and so forth and so on in repetition all the way across the entire polymer until you get this kind of thing going over and over and over and over for hundreds or thousands of repeating units. Isn't that neat? So this kind of polymer made of a single monomer whose structure contains a carbon-carbon double bond is called an addition polymer. This table taken from our text shows the structures of a few different addition polymers. And this YouTube video, not made by me, but linked to in the description below and possibly floating over my head as an in-video card link, gives some additional insight into polymerization and polymers. I highly recommend you click it because it's a cool video. So how in the world do you identify an addition polymers monomer? Well, all you do is take the structure of your polymer, as drawn here, for example, and then just throw away these two brackets and the letter N and just put a double bond between the two carbons. That's essentially it. So here's the generic addition polymer structure. Again, the letter N just represents some unspecified number of repeating units over and over. And the letter R represents either a hydrocarbon or some other atom or group that will vary from one polymer to another. So again, if you're given this kind of structure drawing and you're asked, what is the monomer used to make this polymer? All you do is throw away the brackets and the letter N, erase the single bond to the left and the right of this repeating unit and put a double bond in the middle between the two carbons so that you arrive at the monomer that looks like this. That's it. That's as exciting slash boring as these addition polymers monomers get. Whew. So with that said, let's put your knowledge to the test. Can you draw the monomer used to make polyvinyl chloride or PVC whose polymer structure is shown right here? I'll leave you to tackle that on your own. What then of condensation polymers? Well, here are some examples of synthetic, that is human-made polymers called condensation polymers. Now you'll notice, looking at these examples, that they each contain either nitrogen-containing parts or oxygen-containing parts. In other words, I've got a region of each polymer that has two NHs with a little carbon group in the middle. These examples are encased in blue boxes or oxygens, two oxygens with some type of carbon or carbony structure between them. Is that clear okay? Now just so you know, the nitrogen containing examples here are called nylons, while the oxygen containing ones are called polyesters. Again then, identifying the monomers used in condensation polymers is a little trickier than addition polymers. 
Nylons, as it turns out, always require two monomers, a diamine and a diacid. Here's how you figure that out. You first of all draw the structure of your nylon, and this is a generic one shown here where the letter R could represent any number of different specific carbons or carbony groups. Then you just circle or box two nitrogens with whatever carbon groups are between them. You then pull this piece out and lay one additional H on each of the left and right ends. That is called a diamine, and it's one of the two ingredients needed to make this polymer. You follow? Now, what is the second ingredient, this diacid ingredient? Well, for that, all I do is put a box around the two carbon-oxygen double bond groups and whatever carbon -y groups are between them. I could have just as easily done the same with this group over here, but they're structurally identical. I then pull this structure out, and I lay an X on each end. Now, what does X represent? Well, X represents either a chlorine or an OH. And as it turns out, either of these different molecules work. In other words, you can have the molecule shown right here with a chlorine on each end. That's called a diacid chloride. Or you can have the structurally identical group that just has OHs in place of the two chlorines. That is called just a diacid. As it turns out, there's pros and cons of each. A diacid chloride with the two chlorines is much more reactive, but it's also often more toxic. Whereas a diacid itself is less toxic, but sometimes requires additional additives and heat and sometimes catalysts in order to get the polymerization to occur. In any event, these are the two monomers you would need to make this polymer. You grab the diamine and you react it with the diacid, or you could react it with the diacid chloride. Either case could be used to form this polymer. Does that make sense okay? Here then is a link to a separate video, linked to in the description below, that shows the formation of a beautiful condensation polymer. Let's now apply that analogous knowledge to polyesters. So like nylons, polyesters also require two monomers. In this case, a diol, also called a dialcohol, and a diacid. How to figure that out is very similar. I draw the structure of the polyester. Then I look at the two oxygens and whatever carbon or carbony groups are between them and put a box around those two. I pull that piece out and lay a single hydrogen on each end. That is called a diol or dialcohol. Now, separately, I do the exact same thing. I grab the two carbon-oxygen double bond groups that are, of course, tethered together by some number of carbons or carbony group, put a box around them, and then pull that piece out. And again, I could have just as easily done it with this piece over here because structurally it's identical to the one that I put in this box. I lay down an X on each end, keeping in mind that X either represents a chlorine or an OH. Either molecule will work. Just as before, if X's are chlorines, then this is a diacid chloride. If they're OH's, then it's just a simple diacid. So to answer kind of question about this, you'd have to write down or select all three monomers as possibilities of making this polymer. The diol, the diacid chloride, and the diacid itself. That takes us then to some beautiful sample problems. I want you to use the techniques I just showed you to draw the structures of the monomers used to make each of the following polymers. Nylon 66, whose full polymeric structure is shown here, and polyethylene terephthalate, whose structure is shown right here. Now, I'm not gonna show you how to do these here, but there is a link in the description below that will take you to a separate video in which I do. I hope that that link and my teachings on this are useful. Until next time, my wonderful students and others, please have an enjoyable rest of your day.